you might not readily associate bearings with the broad subject of fluid power. However, a quick review of the components that make up fluid power and fluid handling systems, like hydraulic power units, air compressors, hydraulic pumps and motors, plus air and hydraulic actuators, all underscores the critical role bearings play in the fluid power industry. Bearing selection is crucial in helping achieve optimum pump or motor performance. Bearing type, ball, roller, needle, or sleeve, for example, and bearing size and bearing class, as well as dynamic load rating and wear resistance, all impact operating efficiency. When a circulation pump runs off BEP, its best efficiency point, problems like cavitation and fatigue can occur. Proper bearing selection helps ensure the pump operates at the point where it is least prone to failure and life expectancy is greatest. That's why it's important that fluid power systems engineers consider which bearing technologies are most suitable to the applications at hand. When equipment problems do occur, bearing failure and analysis programs can help prevent future failure and even predict reliability. Now our first speaker has a 22,000 square foot warehouse stocked with just about every kind of bearing available. He has extremely large bearings for larger applications and even carries the smallest ball bearing in the world. This bearing is made by a company in Lebanon, New Hampshire and contains balls inside the casing. Several dozen of these bearings could fit on a penny and can be used in aircraft and satellite applications. Joining us now is Steve Katz, president of Emerson Bearing Company, ball and roller bearing experts serving the OEM and maintenance markets. Steve, first of all, welcome to Global Spec. And if you would tell us why you were interested in joining us for this fluid power and fluid handling event. Fluid power is very important to us, and we define that as our ability to service pumps, the pump, compressor, and electric motor industry. This was really the start of the company. When we formed the company in, well, by my father and his partner in the late 50s, the motor industry was really big in New England. At that point, they were, there was a need for all, you know, lower price bearings. My father and his partner were the first to start importing bearings from Japan. And we found that there was a real niche where people wanted product on the shelf and they wanted local availability. And the pump market really requires that type of service. Well, Steve, what about the motor industry? Do they have different needs? The different technical needs, whether it be for an air compressor, for a ski area, or a wastewater treatment plant, or general purpose pumps. The compressors now we service are for whether it be ski areas or large bore equipment for rock drilling and so on. Uh, it's still the same needs as 40, 50 years ago because the industry hasn't changed so much. But now, because bearings are technically better, there's a lot more we can do and it's a very important market for us. Well, Steve, what would be the optimum seal for challenging environments? Is that the isolator seal? The isolator seal, this solves a problem because 90% of bearing failures are due to contamination. The isolator seal works by an internal labyrinth. These are easy to mount. They're standard size dimensions, and they solve a lot of problems. Granted, more expensive than a typical lip seal, but once again, to avoid a failure, this is a solution, particularly in pumps and compressors. Well, Steve, one of our attendees needs to create a shield on an open bearing, and he questions whether the nylos ring would work for this application. Most people don't realize by utilizing this ring, which fits flush against the outer bearing surface, we can actually create a seal or a shield on an open bearing. This is in extreme situations where you don't want the bearing to be contaminated. You want to keep grease in, contaminants out. So this has been a real solution for a lot of people. Now what can you tell us about split bearings? Split bearings are a very unique solution. And for the right application, they make a world of difference. This is the FAG style split bearing. And basically, I'm not going to take it apart because all, all the balls or roll, all the rollers would fall on top of me. But basically, everything has been cut in half. So when it's time to replace it, the bearing is sitting in the housing. Simply take off the top part of the worn bearing. You wind in the new one, and you're back in operation in hours as opposed to days. This style 
uses spherical roller bearings, rollers. The craft style, or the former, what people refer to as a Cooper style, utilizes cylindrical rollers, okay? This is typical in uh, propulsion, dry, marine drive shafts, and so on. So once again, take off the top cap. You can wind in, see these are all split. It's all split off. And you can drop in a new one, simply wind it around. But this is a very unique solution that saves a tremendous amount of downtime, especially in larger applications. This way you don't have to take apart your shaft, take off your gears, and really look for other problems. So this is a great solution. Now I know a big part of your business is bearing failure and analysis. What can you tell us about that? Bearing failure and analysis is one of the items that we're really trying to promote to particularly the pump, compressor, motor market. Bearings tell a story. Many times we have people come to us and say, well, I really thought that bearing was going to last a lot longer. While the fact is, most bearings don't fail prematurely. When they do fail prematurely before that so-called bearing life that we expect, there are typically causes involved. These can be, whether it be electrical currents running through, bad atmosphere, uh, they can be heavy shock loads. Typically bearings should achieve their normal life. We have developed a program where we literally show people, if you hold the bearing, we show them pictures. If they show us a picture, we have them match them up with pictures, whether they be on the internet, our internet site, or in handouts we have, we can show people pretty accurately, well, if this is what the bearing looks like after it failed, here's why it probably failed, and here's how to correct it. This has become a very important part of our business. Now, Emerson Bearing has certainly been around for decades. Could you give us a little history about the company? The history of Emerson Bearing actually relates to the overall formation of the company in the late 50s. Originally, our sister company, Action Bearing, was the main uh, nameplate out there. Action Bearing was selling to both the OEM, original equipment manufacturers, and MRO, maintenance requirements of New England industry. We were one of the first people to actually go to Japan and Europe and start importing directly. What we did was bring in product, we had product on the shelf. Also, we did it out of necessity because there weren't many lines available to newcomers such as ourselves. We also were the first people to start the NTN franchise. NTN, which is now number three in the world, had a little office in Long Island City. We went down there, actually my father and his partner, and were the first distributor for NTN, which is a real breakthrough, especially in New England. So Action Bearing sold to this general marketplace. Emerson Bearing was formed as our wholesale arm. That represented probably 5% of our business. However, over time, probably 15, 20 years ago, when we saw our New England market decline, after all, where's Wang Labs today, digital equipment, Polaroid, all the textile mills, wire mills, and so on. At that point, rather than let the company atrophy, we decided to take a different route. We decided to say, let's have Emerson Bearing be our niche market arm. We knew we had expertise in 12 to 15 viable markets, whether it be amusement park ride builders, aggregate, paper, printing, robotics, and so on. We knew we could do th those things very well. So we changed Emerson Bearing into a direct sales agent. No more wholesale. And that was the big switch. So Emerson Bearing now represents 55% of our dollar volume. Em Action Bearing is still surviving and plunking along and doing great for the market that's here. But what Emerson Bearing is able to do is provide niche markets, whether it be cut to length leaf chain, uh, forklift carrier bearings, uh, specialty free running bearings, and other specialty parts. So Emerson really serves these niche markets, 
bring product, bring expertise and inventory at several price points to the marketplace. So that's Emerson Bearing, where it was and what it's evolved because the marketplace keeps evolving and changing and so do we. But your staff hasn't changed much in the past few decades and I understand one of your longtime employees is with you today. His name's Henry. Henry's been with us 20 years and he's not that much older. I mean, a good part of his uh, adult life has you know, been working here. His father worked here before him. And most of our employees have been with us minimum 15 or 20 years, which is something we're very, very proud of. Everyone here starts, including myself, started in the warehouse because you have to learn the numbering system. You have to actually hold the bearing to really understand what it's saying to you. So we're very proud of the fact that our 22, of our 22 employees, most have been here quite a while. We've had a few people already retire and one of the prouder moments for all of us in the family has been seeing people raise families, buy homes, and have a life away from selling bearings and enjoy being here as well. Well, Steve, I know you have an impressive warehouse and I understand you prepared a video tour to share with us. Thanks very much. Once again, when we decided that bearings were how we were gonna make our living and not diversify into other areas, we also made the decision that we couldn't be around the corner from everybody. With our contracts with UPS, FedEx, and many others, we can deliver a product from this central warehouse overnight to really anywhere in the country. We also ship overseas, whether it be Guam, some oil fields in Russia, and Latin and Central America. So having this warehouse has really helped us. It also gives us an idea of having the right product on the shelf at various price points. We believe in inventory and having parts available that we can see and get out the door. So let's go take a look at it. Welcome to our warehouse. Here we have 22,000 square feet of product at various price points. This represents all different styles of ball and roller bearings, plus linear motion, bushings, pillow blocks, and so on. So we're just gonna walk through a little so you can see everything. Here we have camp followers, down these various aisles, we have all different styles of bearings, hopefully all neatly put away and stored. As we move along here, this is one of the innovations we put in about 15, 20 years ago. We recognized that the best way for us to purchase was in bulk or in volume to then be able to pass on savings and service to our customer base. We put in this full deck mezzanine, which runs the length of the building. So when we bring product in, we store it on the mezzanine by category. In the warehouse, we basically have everything assigned a set of linear space. So when an order puller goes to pull an order, he is told by the pick ticket where it should be. Hopefully we get it right. 62, 6300 series, double row ball. Every bearing has a spot to go in. Excess inventory that doesn't fit on the shelf either goes to the mezzanine or goes to our rear bulk warehouse. And running along these aisles, you get a sense of the different styles of bearings that we keep in inventory. Double row, slim series, super precision, angular contact, cylindrical and needle. These are many of our more popular series. Upstairs and off in the way back, we have more specialty items, whether it be slim section, linear, bronze, and so on. In the back warehouse, we added this on 25 years ago. This is where we keep oil seals, bulk storage in these tea boxes, we call them, roller chain. We do quite a bit with roller chain and leaf chain. We're very proud of the fact that we inventory product for monthly releases with a lot of customers. They can have just-in-time inventory because we don't. We have product here. When they need it, they can release it. This allows us to set up buy contracts so we can ship monthly product to customers, or in some cases, especially for pump and compressor users, they'll tell us, here are 10 products we'd always like you to have on the shelf for us. We keep them here in Boston, and that way we can ship overnight if and when they have a problem. And that's 
These items up here, we're going to be shipping 2,000 a month for the next 12 months to this customer. So it's very important that they know they have product here waiting for them. And we try to do this at a fixed price wherever possible. In many cases, we do have the ability to modify bearings per the customer's needs. This customer wanted to have a retaining ring, a snap ring, put in the OD of the bearing. What this does is when they're pressing it in, this helps locate it within the housing. We do quite a bit of modification. This could be modified lubrication, snap rings, as I said, grinding the ID. We also can modify the OD of the bearing to have a groove put in. That's for the wire industry, for drawing wire or killing the wire, they call it. Once again, we have to pay particular attention to keeping the bearings dry and lubricated so we don't have any corrosion issues. In this case, these are all going out to a company that repairs railroad drive motors. These bearings over here are all for a company in the paper industry. And what we're doing here is we've modified the lubricant. We've combined some oil and grease, made a very slim section of oil. And we've added a tacking agent so that it, the lubricant adheres to the balls very thoroughly, but has very low drag. Also, specialty bearings that might be unground style, which are no longer being made, we can have made for us. Lead times might be a little out there, but they are available. We recently did this for a company in Germany that bought the bearings from Spain, and we had everything come together for the customer. In this section, we keep our specialty seals some of which are split seals or some of the isolator seals, and some of the slim section bearings. One of the slim section bearings we recently sold to a company that's making prosthetic feet of all things because it allows flexion and a very thin cross section. So we go from very big to very, very small in all styles. We do quite a bit with linear motion. This is our linear motion area. In the small area, you can have quite a bit of product. This aisle is mostly insert bearings for pillow blocks and what's called unground bearings. Thank you for being part of our little tour today. Certainly appreciate the opportunity to show us, show you our warehouse and all the things that we're proud of. Hope you enjoyed it. Please give us a call. Thank you. And Steve, what can you tell us about the history of bearings? People would like to think that there's some cave wall where someone happens upon and they see someone who invented the bearing. But actually bearings have evolved with the wheel, the uh, ability to take rolling elements, putting them between two points of friction. Whether it be uh, pulling along chariots in old time Egypt, uh, which we have some great sketches of, to evolving to the first drawings made by Leonardo da Vinci of what he thought a bearing should be. But the real breakthrough in terms of bearings came in the late 1800s when steel evolved, got, became much more viable, easier to use and form. With that came the ability to take balls or rollers, put in between uh, the housing or shaft dimensions, and create a more accurate turning. So the first bearings that were used in industry were in textile machinery, pro wood processing, and so on. So the history now, even though bearings look the same, they're still evolving. The steel is better. The ability to process the equipment has improved. The one nice thing about the history of bearings is that in the mid-1920s, two organizations, the a ABMA and the ISO standards, from Europe got together and created a worldwide numbering system so that like aspirin conforms to a standard, so do bearings. They typically go up in five millimeter increments so that if you get a bearing from whether it be made in Europe, Japan, Asia, Brazil, Russia, if it's a 1205 bearing, well that's what it is. It has a 25 millimeter bore. It has, it's a self-aligning bearing with a relatively large OD. But the history of bearings, while 
it has evolved, it still remains true to the original uh, standards of the 20s and 30s, which really pushed the Industrial Revolution forward because it allowed people to replace a bearing if they were taking out a 1205 bearing. They could go to their local store, put one in, and they knew it would be to the same standard. And I wonder if you could also describe for us in greater details what the numbers all mean. The good news about the numbering system in bearings is that when it was established, and the, good, the greater news is now, after some people went rogue, most companies around the world use the so-called SKF, FAG numbering system, which for most bearings is where the first digit or two, on a four-digit number, the first digit tells us the engineering style, whether it be a self-aligning bearing, a radial bearing, a angular contact bearing, and so on. The second digit tells us the relative size of the outside diameter. And fortunately, the last two digits, which are the most important, tell us the size of the shaft that the bearing is going on. An example would be a 6205 bearing. The 6 tells us it's a radial ball bearing. The 2, that it's a medium-sized outer diameter. But most importantly, the 05, you multiply the last two digits by 5, so we know that's a 25 millimeter shaft. The best part is if someone's designing something and they think, oh, this is so special, they can put in a standard bearing right out of the catalog to meet their engineering need because it all fits the same envelope dimensions. You can have bearings running along the same shaft with the same boundary dimensions that have different engineering styles and can accomplish various things, whether it be self-alignment, heavy loads, two rows of balls, and so on. Or you can have alternatives with the same shaft with different outside dimensions. And we can show how this works with this little demonstration. Bearings typically come in two major categories, ball or roller. And the good news is for different applications, you can have the same boundary dimensions for different bearings to accomplish a different thing. So we'd first like to show, and also once again, the numbering system indicates what you know, the style is. We have some fairly large examples of bearings. This is a cylindrical roller bearing. Inner and outer ring can be mated. A spherical roller bearing with rollers. The advantage here is you have self-alignment. A self-aligning ball bearing. Typically this was in the textile industry, but it's in packaging, plastics, and so on. Then this is a good example of an axial bearing or a thrust bearing with mated parts. And this sits along the shaft and takes load going this way. But one of the key things I want to demonstrate is the options that people have with different style bearings. Okay. These are all the same ID and OD, same inside dimension and outside dimension, but they're all very different bearings internally. So if we put these all together, you'd see they could fit in the same hole, ID and OD, but they're all very, very different. And once again, you'll see the pattern of the numbering system, how it's identical. This is a 1205 bearing, which is a self-aligning, once again, 25 millimeter shaft, bearing that accepts loads radially, but also axially, and it self-aligns to accommodate that. Here we have a 3205 bearing, the three indicating it's a double row ball bearing. It has two rows of balls, once again, 25 millimeter shaft. This is typically used in material handling industry and every and other heavy duty industries. The 6205, this, once again, 25 by 52 millimeters. These are all 25 by 52 millimeters. 6205 is in the radial bore category, which is the most popular category in the world of bearings. Most motors and so on, compressors, although the bearings are much bigger. Okay, the 87505, this represents the felt seal series. They're no longer using felt seal so much, but these are a great design tool when you need a standoff on the ID. If 
you put these together, there's actually a small gap. And that's created by an extended inner ring. Okay? The 7205, the 7 indicates that it can take more angular load. Literally, one face has a higher shoulder, so the ball can ride up on it, and this can accept more load. Typically, you might want to mount these in pairs so that you have load that can run both directions. Okay? Once again, angular contact simply means more combined load axially and radially. Now, I have these. Now, you might ask, why are there two together? These are machine tool bearings. Machine tool bearings have tighter tolerances. They have to be run in pairs. And they're typically been faced off. And the preload, preload indicates how rigid or tight you want the bearing assembly to be, have to be controlled. Once again, you see the pattern of all the same sizes with different options. The insert bearing here, an insert bearing is what could go into a pillow block or an independent housing. The advantage is larger grease cavity, easier to mount because it can be with set screws or an eccentric lock collar, and you can have a lubrication ring. The most popular of this style for us are free running bearings, which go into the printing industry, low torque, low drag applications. Now, if you have a lot of axial load, and you have it in both directions, think of a car wheel would be the most common one people would relate to. You have a cup and cone bearing or taper roller bearing. This separates and mounts together. This goes in the housing, this along your shaft, put together with a mating, pair, mating unit. And this way it can take load from both directions. High radial load, high axial load. Okay? And they fall apart when you don't hold them together. Okay. Then we have a cylindrical roller bearing here. Once again, with the same envelope dimensions, we can have rollers or, and you see, so the rollers are attached to the outer ring. This is an NU style. And you mount the inner ring to the shaft. Many failures, you can see this is why you have potential for failures in this style more than others. When you mate them together, for demonstration purposes, this is pretty simple, but under load it's more difficult. When this is put together, the ring and all the mating surfaces should be concentric and perpendicular. Otherwise you'll have failure because it's easy to score this raceway here. That raceway. Okay. And the last of the styles of bearings that once again are the same would be a spherical roller bearing. High load, not as high as speed, but provide some self-alignment as well. Now for pure thrust, think of a potter's wheel. This is an axial bearing or thrust bearing. Once again, same boundary dimensions, but all the load has to go this way or this way. And it accepts no radial load, radial load being referred to as perpendicular to the shaft line. Okay. Now we've seen that you can have all the same ID and OD bearings you know, for an application. But also I want to demonstrate that for the same shaft, you can have heavier load carrying capacity by going up that second digit. The second digit, whether it be, let's say going from a six, in this case a five, it's a 25 millimeter shaft. You can have a 6005, 6205, or 6305. There's even a 6405. So let's say you spec in that you want the same shaft dimension throughout, but you will have more load at one part of the application, then you certainly you just move up on your OD dimension. And they go pretty thin too. There's a 6905 and a 6805. I'd also like to mention that the universality of design in terms of metric dimensions and how they go in ascending order also applies to other products. Some of these other products, naturally, would be oil seals. This happens to be another style of isolator seal. These are 25 millimeters once again. Traditional lip seal in all styles. 
but also let's say you have sliding or linear motion that you want to incorporate into your design. Once again, these are, this is a so-called super style or your traditional style. These are linear motion bearings. Once again, it can be designed in along the same shaft line. Uh, in automation and robotics, these are essential components. Spherical bushings, where you don't have rolling elements. Think of a knuckle bushing on a uh, style of excavator would be that. And then these, this shows pretty easily, once again, thrust bearings. So once again, conforming to the same dimensional categories and boundary dimensions that we had discussed earlier on the radial ball and cylindrical roller bearings. And that's the wacky world of bearings. Thanks for the question and uh, hope people can see that although these bearings are relatively small, the same applies to all the styles of bearings and all the sizing options that they have. Hope this is helpful. Hi Steve, let's talk a little terminology if we can. I'll throw out some terms typically bandied about and the first one is ABEC class. ABEC class refers to a standard of tolerances that were established once again in the 20s. Bearing manufacturers got together and said, not only are we going to have a numbering system that's uniform, but we're going to have a set of tolerances. So they're literally saying standard grade, which is referred to as ABEC 1, will have the following tolerances. So they know that the inner and outer ring and the balls conform to a tolerance that has, goes out to three or four decimal places. An ABEC 3 bearing has tighter tolerances still. Now, when bearings were uh, actually 40, 50 years ago, a standard bearing was an ABEC 1. Now with metallurgy improving and manufacturing techniques, most bearings manufactured worldwide are close to an ABEC 3 bearing. They run quiet and smooth. If someone needs more precision, less, uh, they want less what's called run out where the bearings could wobble a bit and speed, they go to an ABEC 5 or a machine tool grade which is ABEC 7 or ABEC 9. So these are critical values. One of the important things we stress as a company in terms of sourcing is that people only buy the accuracy they really need. Some people say, well, I only want an ABEC 1 bearing, pay for it because it's less expensive, for an ABEC 7 application. That will lead to failure or poor performance. It also goes the other way. If someone only requires an ABEC 1 or 3 grade bearing, they should not be buying an ABEC 7. The one little anecdotal thing that happens here at our pickup counter, we often have people who are on rollerblades. They'll walk in and say, okay, I want a 608 bearing, which is an 8 millimeter bearing bearing, which is the second most popular bearing in the world. It also goes into every vacuum cleaner motor and mag motor. And they'll walk in off the counter. We have a big student population in this area. They'll say, I want that 608 bearing and I want an ABEX 7. And we look at them and say, you don't need a 7. Oh, but that's what the local skate wheel shop is selling. Well, the fact is an ABEX 7 bearing can turn, let's say, has a limiting speed of, let's say, 80,000 RPM, something crazy like that. Whereas a standard ABEC 3 bearing, which might cost $2 as opposed to the ABEC 7 at $8, will have a 20,000 RPM limit. Also, the bigger factor is once someone steps off a curb on a roller blade on an ABEC 7 bearing and they clunk, they hit that raceway, they've put a minor imperceptible to the naked eye bump or a little divot in the raceway and it brings the limiting speed down to 20 or 30,000 RPM anyway. So once again, they'd be paying too much for an application that doesn't require that style or expensive bearing. Well, you just saved our inline skaters in the audience a bunch of money, and I'm sure they're thankful for that. Next, can you tell us about internal clearance? Internal clearance is one of the more misunderstood aspects of bearings. It's, it it uh, refers to the amount of displacement a shaft would have in relation to the outer ring. For a bearing to turn, for the ball or roller to turn, you have to have some gap between the balls and rollers and the rings. This is a very tight tolerance 
For most applications, for motors and pumps, we call out what's called a C3 clearance. People hear this term internal clearance and they see the letter C and a number after it and they wonder, well, what's that really mean? What it means is that in ascending order, C0, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and so on, 5 is unusual, that means there's more clearance between the balls or rollers and the running surfaces. This is really essential to have because what it allows is for a film of lubricant to run through the bearing. It allows heat to be dispersed. If the tolerances aren't proper when you mount the bearing, you're going to get the rings tighten up and take out the clearance. So it's really critical to have the proper life. Also, certain applications run hot. Uh, we do a lot of business with a railroad drive, a traction motor bearing, where it's a C4 clearance by design. Under initial load when it's turning, it sounds a little clunky. You actually hear the rollers. But what happens as the bearing heats up, thermal expansion of the metal actually makes it a C2 or C3 clearance, tightens it all up, and it runs smoothly and perfectly. So it's very important to pay a lot of attention to clearance. Too tight a clearance, the bearing will seize. Too loose a clearance, it'll sound like uh, rocks are in the motor. All right, up next, angular contact. Yes, angular contact is that combined load. Some bearings are actually designed in to take angular load as a standard, as opposed to just an infrequent load. Bearings like this would be the 7200 series, which are extremely popular in machine tools and in pumps, where some of the load can be from the side. And it's very important that it be accepted properly. Typically, angular load, especially in angular contact bearings, the 7200 or 7300 series, which are very popular in compressors, are used in pairs so that the load can be from either side. Okay, how about bearing life? Bearing life refers to the number of revolutions a bearing can uh, accomplish under normal fatigue, under normal compressive stress. Most bearings can go a certain amount of revolutions and there's a B10 life where a group of bearings are tested. 90% of a group of bearings can go a certain number of hours. Okay, now let's take some more questions from our attendees. The first one says, what are the primary causes of premature failure in roller bearings? The primary causes are, what we see, especially in motors, is when people have not mounted them properly. This is typically the largest cause. It's very important when mounting, especially a cylindrical roller bearing, that everything be, be mounted in a concentric way with the proper tools. We don't recommend hammers, and we do recommend induction heating of the elements so they can be slid onto the shaft, mounted in the housing properly. The other major causes would be improper lubrication, not understanding internal clearances, and in terms of the environment, not allowing environmental or ambient uh, factors affect the proper operation of the bearing. If the bearing isn't sealed properly, if elements, if uh, sand, dust, dirt, snow on traction motors, if they get into the bearing and the drive, then you're going to have premature failure, typically. Okay, and here's the follow-up to that. It asks, are those the usual reasons for other bearing types, such as ball bearings or mounted units, to prematurely fail? Absolutely. There's no magic to the different styles of bearings, one versus another. If they're all subjected to the same incorrect mounting or lubrication or treatment, they all will have the potential to fail prematurely. All right, our next one. Are certain industries more prone to certain failures? It's not that certain industries are more prone to certain failures. It's just that people have to understand that the application dictates the life or the effective use of the bearing. As I said earlier, a good example would be a spherical roller bearing should not ex be expected to have the same life in a sand and gravel yard that has in a printing press. All right, next we have, 
Can the operating environment hasten bearing failure? The operating environment is often critical to what people's anticipated expectations are for how long the bearing should last. In high heat situations, whether it be an asphalt plant or sand and gravel or in an oven, let's say even in food processing, it's critical that we adapt the style of bearing to that application. Typically this would be possibly using an oil-fed uh, lubricating system, having larger internal clearances, having proper lubricants that might be more technical greases. But the operating environment is really critical as a factor in getting proper bearing life. I will look at another one. It asks, what value does a distributor such as Emerson Bearing deliver to its customers beyond bearing selection? The fact is that for better or worse, we made a decision 25 years ago that bearings were how we were going to make our living. Many of, our, many of the people in our industry, other distributors, decided that bearings was a tough way to make a living. So they diversified into many other areas. And good luck to them, whether it be motors, hydraulics, electronics, and so on. What we found by being bearing specialists and understanding what the products require and understanding niche markets, the industry, and we've created industry solutions for 16 major markets. We have to be experts in what we do. First of all, the industry requires it. We have a lot of great competitors. And our ability to find bearings worldwide at various price points has been key to our success. Also trying to be good listeners. Our customers tell us what they need. We try to respond promptly and accurately and have product on the shelf. We have customers where we ship product out every other day all over the country because they tell us what they need and we respond promptly. And in many cases do what people down the street can't do because bearings are all we do. All right, Steve, we have a attendee who would like to know to what extent Emerson Bearing gets involved with troubleshooting customer problems. We get involved almost every day with customers saying, this bearing didn't seem to give me the life I expected, or how can it run cooler, or can I switch over to this other country of origin because it's 15 or 20 percent cheaper. This is an essential part of our business and our success because we're dealing with a product that at some level is perceived as a commodity. People say, well, I'm just filling a hole. What does it matter what I put in it? What's critical to our success, if we want to continue to be successful, is that we respond to that question because people have a lot of uh, potential alternatives to put into that hole, fill that envelope dimension. And we have to be able to respond to tell them what's proper so that it's not just a commodity, it's their potential success in running their business. And with that, we're going to have to wind things up. Steve Katz, I want to thank you very much for joining us today for this interview and sharing your extensive knowledge of bearings. I'm sure our attendees found your presentation very, very helpful. I certainly hope so. This is a special event for us. It's certainly beyond the traditional walking through a convention hall or having a salesperson walk in your door. And we look forward to having an opportunity to meet up with people. In this operating environment, this economy, it's a good idea for us to be in places where we can be found. With everyone working so hard, it's difficult to get in front of decision makers. So this is a great opportunity for us to meet and greet people in an environment where everyone feels comfortable. Now, Steve and his staff will be manning their booth in the exhibit hall, so please stop by and say hello. And I think it's important to point out that what Steve has just demonstrated is a small part of the services that Emerson Bearing offers to its customers. And to learn more about how Emerson Bearing can help you improve your business, just take a moment to look for Steve or any of the Emerson Bearing staffers in their booth on the exhibit floor of today's event. They're ready to show you some of their other products and services that they have to offer. And when we do end this session, I would ask you to please take a